I'm not used to having a pulpit up here. Look at this. He must be back. I always say pulpits are for sissies, Mike. I... Ladies and gentlemen, do me a favor. Give a warm welcome to our lead pastor, Mr. Mike, Pastor Mike. Paisley shirt and all. Oh, wow, awesome. Thank you for that welcome back. The great signs, my favorite was, welcome back, Dee Dee and Pastor Mike, too. <laughs> uh, yoga ministry's exploding. So, uh, hey, good, good stuff. Seriously, wow, thank you. Um, thank you to uh, those of you here, to those of you joining us online, the, the folks over at the East Campus and the venue. Um, it is great to be back. Four months, it, it flew by in, in so many ways, but uh, uh, it feels wonderful. It feels wonderful to be back and, and be back in the pulpit. It's kind of like sleeping in your own bed, you know? It's like I visited so many other churches, but the opportunity to come back and worship here with you and see so many warm and, and, and friendly, familiar faces, it's been, uh, it's been great. I want to start, uh, before we jump in, I just want to say a few thank yous. I want to thank... Uh, First of all, I want to thank Pastor Keith and our executive team for a great summer. Um, every one of our staff, every single staff person had to shoulder more responsibility with my absence. And I thank them. I thank the leaders. Yeah, I thank the leaders of our church who helped us put together a plan on the front end so I could step away for those four months, and you guys flawlessly executed that plan. You servants in the, the vac vacation Bible school, children's ministry, hospitality, worship, just across the board, New Hope Resource Center, you guys knocked it out of the park uh, this summer. And for those of you who continued to, to give and serve and come faithfully, those of you who were here every week and didn't see my absence as an excuse to be gone, I want to say thank you to all 12 of you. Yeah. Give it up. Those dirty dozen who came regardless. So, uh, hey, as for me, uh, my sabbatical was indeed a, a, a pause that refreshed. Um, somebody says, hey, do you, did you enjoy it? And I'm like, well, if you don't enjoy four months off, you're doing it wrong, right? That's on nobody but, but you. So if you don't remember, my, my sabbatical was organized around four key components. Stop, rest, contemplate, and delight. I stopped. I mean, that was, that was kind of the, the easy part, just stopping, not coming back to I can honestly say I did not come onto property the entire time uh, of the sabbatical except to throw some stuff in the dumpster from my, uh, from my, my basement that is something that you cannot do, but that's a perk of <laughs> our maintenance people are like, what are you saying that? <laughs> I get that perk. Uh, and to attend a couple yoga classes with my wife. That's the only thing I, I, I truly disconnected. I rested. And it was more than just getting an extra hour of sleep in the morning, which, by the way, is awesome. <laughs> but uh, I rested knowing that uh, I could easily step down off my little throne because God was still on his big throne. And we had put together a plan that we had discerned from God, and I knew that that plan was going to be executed. I could rest trusting that God was going to provide. Um, contemplate is kind of the, really the, the connection with, with God peace. And, and most days, um, I will say that no matter if you're off or on, uh, you still have to be intentional about your time with God. You can, you can get up and be busy all day long and, and really never accomplish anything. Uh, so it had to be intentional, but I had some very sweet time with Jesus, especially my five-day retreat in Ireland. And uh, by the way, if you're gonna take a five-day retreat, I highly recommend Ireland. Um, while I was there, uh, this was the sabbatical, the, the hermitage uh, that I stayed in over at Glendalock Hermitage. Uh, I was basically in that. There were four other ones on, on the campus there. Each, uh, each hermitage had one individual in it. We were all on silent retreat, so we'd walk by one another and we'd go. Um, 
no talking, uh, kind of ate in, in my own meals there, kind of really fasted the most of the time I was there. Really didn't come out except in the evening to take a, uh, to take a walk, and that was uh, the, the sunset that I got to enjoy at the end of every day. Me, me Jesus, and a million flies in the heel, hills, of, uh, in the hills of, of Ireland, but it's just a beautiful sunset. And, and, uh, and while I was there uh, on that five-day silent retreat, um, which, yeah, I'm type A, yeah, I'm extroverted, but that time just to sit um, and be with Jesus that long was amazing. It was one of the most profound parts of my entire time away. More on that uh, as, we, uh, as we go down the road. Lots to share on that. But, but just at a high level, some of the things that God told me during those five days was, hey, Mike, what would it be if you stopped seeing me, God, as your boss so much and, and began to really see me as your father? I believe God is my boss. He's my Lord. Um, he's my master. But God wants me to see myself not as someone who has to do, do, do for God to please him as much as to just embrace his gift of love for me, to see him as my father, not my boss. I, I was able to experience some forgiveness in, in, in my life for for uh, trying to be too much of a people pleaser, quite honestly, for, for 30 years, to spend a little too much time trying to placate ministry critics instead of leaning in to develop fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. I heard God telling me two places, two types of people that I want you to invest in are people who are very far from God, people who are deeply irreligious and don't have any relationship with, with Christ. And I want you to, I want you to impact and, and invest in people who are, who are serious about their faith, who want to go deeper, who want to, to begin practicing th their Christianity and grow fully into the image of Jesus Christ. So I heard God say both of those things. And what I, what I would say most of all is it's amazing what you actually hear from God, not audibly, but what you kind of your spirit hears from God when you slow down enough to actually spend time with him. So that was the contemplate, and, and obviously I did some delighting, did a lot of delighting while I was in Scotland and, uh, and Ireland. We got to attend the British Open, the Open Championship at Carnoustie, and the really cool thing, my, my son Sam and me are both golfers, so the next week we actually got to play Carnoustie. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the unfortunate thing is when we were walking out to the first tee, we were getting ready to tee off, uh, it was a foursome, Sam, me, um, our caddies, and, and two other golfers. Walking up to the first tee, and I felt something on my shoulder. A bird had flown over. <laughs> it's not a good sign of how to start your round of golf. Uh, the next day, I got back at the birdies at a place called St. Andrews, the old course. Uh, Sam and I got to play that. I birdied the first hole. Thank you very much. <laughs> Kind of went downhill from there, but uh, that's coming in at 18. So we also got to, to do some bike riding. My wife loves to, to ride bikes, so uh, Katie Trail. And, and while we were in New York at the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality Conference, we got to bike ride through Central Park, one of our favorite things to do there. Uh, on Father's Day, uh, we were down in Florida. I got to go deep sea fishing, which is really an oxymoron when you're 100 yards out into the Gulf of Mexico and you can see the shore. But uh, got to go fishing with my boys on Father's Day. Father's Day, probably the best Father's Day I've ever had, and, and to see them be able to, to catch some fish. So it was, it was wonderful. Let me ask you, four months off, how does that, how does that sound to you? Sound pretty cool? Take a vacation, paid vacation. Um, you know, re reminder, you know, hey, I got uh, all this stuff paid for. This is completely free. You didn't pay for it. We got a grant that, that paid for that. Does that sound like a pretty cool gig to be able to take four months off? What about you, you students, to be able to take a semester off and travel abroad, all expenses paid? Maybe just to take some time off for four months and, and really kind of just settle in and connect a little more deeply with God, yourself, and others. Now, the sad news is I ain't got that for you today. I ain't got no four-month sabbatical. But here's what I do have. I have a, a, a sampling of such. A, a, a foretaste, a, a kind of mini sabbatical, if you will, called Sabbath. And it's something that God offers to each and every one of us every single week. And it's completely free. Now, here's my favorite definition of Sabbath. Sabbath is God's space 
between the activities of my life. Say this with me. Sabbath is God's space between the activities of my life. Most of us have lives that look a little like this. Right? Now, if you're an English teacher, if you're a grammar teacher, you're having, you're having like OCD meltdown right now, right? I, I, I've got OCD meltdown look like. This is definitely a D minus. This looks like a text message from a seven-year-old, right? All caps, no punctuation. If you really spend enough time, you can read that, but my guess is that's going to look a little better, right? One or two. One or two. Words running together with no spaces or punctuation makes it very difficult to read, doesn't it? If your life feels like this, then perhaps you're ready to hear some good news from God today. Good news that we can all use to be more balanced and live a healthy, more positive, productive life. Talk about something we desperately need. Just ask any group of people. My, my challenge is you go ask any group of 10 people. I don't care where they are, if they're at church or if they're at your work, they're at Walmart or they're at the, the, the soccer field where your, your daughter plays. Go ask any random group of 12 people, young, old, married, single, it doesn't matter. Ask them this question, how was your week? And I guarantee you that 8 out of 10 people will include this word in the response busy, right? You've probably heard it this morning. Hey, how you doing? How's it been this week? Maybe you asked somebody and they said busy. Everybody has so much life that there's very little space between the activities of their life and very small God space between the activities of our life. We have households to manage. We've got kids to carpool and get to the school and extracurricular activities. Uh, most of us are working. Statistically, we're working four more hours every single week than we did less than two decades ago. Doesn't sound like much, but four extra hours, 10% more every single week. And it's not just the adults. Hey, our students, their lives are crazy busy. I live right behind Liberty High School, so I can tell you marching band is at 6.30 in the morning. I'm just glad I'm not on sabbatical because I would not be very pastoral at that point. I'll be getting my extra hour of sleep. 6.30, that means that those kids are getting up at, you know, 5, 5.30 in the morning in order to get to marching band practice. Then there's school. Many of those same kids have extracurricular activities after school. Some work. They come home, and do some chores, do their homework, Snapchat a little bit with their friends, get to bed maybe about 11 o'clock to start it all over the next day. Science. Science and educators make these decisions to get high school kids up that early when science education shows that at that point in our development, high school kids, their brains don't even come on till mid-morning. Parents, we get that, right? It's like, <laughs> you know, and we're getting our kids up. And, 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 and again, statistics show that our kids are sleeping one less hour these days than they were a decade ago, from eight hours to seven hours. And you add that one hour up, for seven days, and guess what you get? They're missing an entire night of sleep over the course of a week. And, and retirees, even retirees, hey, I, I experienced this on my sabbatical. Retirees will tell us that they're busier now than they ever have been. They have no idea how they were able to raise a job, work, a, or raise a family, work a, a full-time job, and still get everything done. Friends, we need some space between the activities of our life. We need some God space, some supernatural space, some Sabbath. Now, Sabbath isn't really something that we talk a lot about these days. It seems kind of archaic, right? It sounds biblical. It sounds very spiritual, so it must be associated with Sunday and worship, right? But, but it sounds kind of Old Testament. It sounds outdated, right? It's not something that we talk about or really practice much. So before we kind of jump to the application point of today's message, I, I want to spend a little bit of time just three important truths about Sabbath. And the first is that, that God created Sabbath. Think about this with me. God created Sabbath rest. Six days, God created the world. Light, dark, uh, land, sea, air, birds, 
moving creatures. Sixth day was the pinnacle of all creation, you and me. Adam and Eve, man and woman, created in the image of God. In the image of God, he created them male and female. On the seventh day, no, wait, 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 wait. Here's what we need to understand. God created the seventh day. The seventh day did not exist until God created the seventh day. He created the first six days. He created a day, and then he did nothing. Or maybe he did the most profound thing he could have done. He created a day, and then he rested. God created Sabbath. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Say the word holy with me. Because on that day, he rested from the work of creating that he had done. Think about all the things that God could have done on the seventh day. First of all, if God would have just created six days, he could have just gone back, and we could have just gone back to Sunday and started all over again. We, in those days, Saturday was the seventh day. The Jewish Sabbath was, was on Saturday, Friday night to, to Saturday night. So he could have just created six days and gone back to day one. He could have created 10 more days and would have had 16 days just of work, but God created a day and then rested. And I think about what could have God done on the seventh day? He could have gone back and he could have done a little more creating. He could have gone back and made, you know, cleaned up some of the mistakes that he made in the first six days. And you're like, well, God made a mistake. Let me just give you two words, flies and mosquitoes. Okay. <laughs> Every day, God said, when he finished his work, it is good. God could have gone back and taken good to great. He could have been excellent. He could have been perfect. But what God did is that God rested. Here's what else I want you to realize about the, the seventh day of rest. Adam and Eve were created on the sixth day. So the seventh day would have been the first day of life for Adam and Eve. The first day of life before God sent them out into the garden to do any work, before God said, here's what I need you to do for me, I need you to prove yourself before I do anything for you, the first thing that God did is he said, I want you to rest. I created you. I want you to rest this first day in my provision. I want to bless you. I think that's maybe a little bit about what Jesus was talking about when God became flesh and, and came among us and said, the Sabbath was made for man and woman, not man and woman for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made on the seventh day. Sabbath was made for man and woman to bless us with the, the ability to put our hope and trust in God. Sabbath was created by God. Now, this, unfortunately for many of us, we need to remember this was not an ask Sabbath. It was not a, uh, a, a, a request. It was not a concession. Hey, if you, if you need to take some time off, if you need to take a break, if you're so much of a wimp that you can't keep going and producing, then go ahead, step back, and, you know, I, God commanded Sabbath. Sabbath means to cease from our work. It's what God did. He stepped back from our work, and he commands you and me to step back from our work. He commands Sabbath. Number four, this is not just any old command. This is number four on God's Big Ten list. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor foreigners residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it, say it with me, he made that Sabbath day holy. God commanded Sabbath. How cool of a God do we have. Notice that our God, probably a very different picture than most gods, uh, at least back in the Old Testament when God was revealing himself to the people and you know, delivering them from slavery and then he's going to make covenant with them and give them these commandments. My, idea, my guess is that he gave his people a very different picture of his type of being a God. He did not say, hey, I want you to build me a monument a hundred foot tall uh, in my own image like Nebuchadnezzar. I don't want a, a pyramid like Pharaoh. 
He's not saying that, that we need to crawl on our hands and knees through the city streets and become bloody, you know, to prove our, our, our worth to God, to take a whip and beat ourselves till, till we bleed in order to demonstrate our faithfulness to God. He's not telling us on Sabbath that we need to come to worship and spend 12 hours here. What God is saying is that we need to step back from our work, stop, rest, contemplate, and delight. God is giving us a gift of grace before we even start our work. What's amazing is how often we struggle to keep this command. My guess is God knew our propensity as human beings to want to have to work, to demonstrate, to prove to God that we're worthy. And so oftentimes we associate our work, our performance with proving our worth, that, that, that God is somehow our boss instead of our father. And so finally, uh, so this is why I think God spends actually more time on the, the fourth commandment. Go to Exodus 20 this afternoon. What you'll notice is that God spends more time explaining Sabbath, more verses, more words explaining Sabbath than any of the other of the Big Ten because he knows that we're a bunch of knuckleheads and we just want to work, 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 go, 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 go. Now, the final thing is, we've said it a few times, Sabbath is a holy day, not a holiday. We had a holiday last Monday, right? Labor Day, so we worked, right? We can't not work on, on Labor Day, so that's a, that's a holiday that we actually work. But, a, but Sabbath is more than a holiday. Listen, Sabbath is also more than a day off. It's not a day off. It's not a day intended to run our errands or, or get caught up on chores or projects or emails. It, it, it's a special day. It's a sacred day. It's a set-apart day. That's what the word holy means. It means set apart. Sabbath was created to be distinctively different than the other six days. We work five days at our job. We have a day off to take care of our errands and chores, and then we have Sabbath, a special day to rest our bodies, but also to renew or refresh our relationships with other people, to delight, to contemplate God and his goodness. And this leads to the deeper purpose in our application, the deeper purpose of Sabbath. Hey, if you're not a Christian, I, I promise you, you could practice Sabbath and it, you would be, you, you would get so many benefits out of it, emotional and physical uh, and mental health from taking that day off. Science has proven that. But, but God didn't give us Sabbath just so we could have physical and emotional and mental health. There's something deeper going on. That Sabbath is actually an invitation for us to, to grow our faith and put our trust in God and his provision. So check this out. Before God gave these Ten Commandments, before God says, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, he was set out to teach his people something very important, that they could trust him. Now, remember the setting. They had been slaves in Egypt. Their parents had been slaves. Their grandparents and their parents and their parents. 400 years, generation after generation, all they knew was slavery. You know what slaves do? They work. You know how often they work? Seven days a week. They made more bricks for Pharaoh's temple. They made more with less. No, no straw for your bricks. It was about being a slave. And now God sent Moses, right? God sent Moses to be his mouthpiece to deliver the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt. They went out of Egypt. They went through the Red Sea. God parted the sea. They walked through on dry land. The, the Egyptians began to pursue them. God pulled the waters back over them, swallowed them up, and God led them to this place of wilderness before they would cross over the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And in that place, for the first time that they could ever remember, they had no concept. It had just been a hope, a pipe dream. Finally, these slaves were free. But you know what they did? They kept acting like slaves which we can understand, right? I mean, if that's all you know, 
If life is bad, if, if you're addicted or you have, you're married, to, you, you, you're dating somebody who's, you know, jacked up and you know, everybody's telling you it's all you know, it's like it's easier to kind of go back to the familiar. All they knew was slavery. That's understandable. Here's what's so not understandable. We act the same way. We act like slaves. We're enslaved. Most of us are enslaved. Some, some of us are enslaved to our jobs. Some of us are enslaved to our house, project after project after project. Some of you are, are enslaved to shopping online or at the malls. Many of us are enslaved to social media. Man, you, you've already checked your, your Twitter and your Snapchat and your Instagram 12 times since I started talking, right? Thankfully, you put your phone on silent before you came in. Some of you, it's TV. You, you just binge watch all, every night and all weekend long. And I get it. It's football season, right? Some students are addicted to studying. Hear that again. Some students are actually addicted to studying because they can't make anything less than an A+. Plus because their identity is tied to performance and perfection, maybe. It could be a hobby. It could be an activity. It could be friends that you can't be by yourself. It could be technology. For most of us, quite honestly, we can't do life without our smartphone, right? Our smartphone is like an oxygen tank. We, we take it wherever we go. We eat with it. We sleep with it. We go to the bathroom with it. And I know that's a bad picture, but it's the truth, right? Harriet Tubman. Remember Harriet Tubman from uh, your, your U.S. history, Civil War, Underground Railroad? She said, I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more if they only knew they were slaves. I think a lot of us have no idea that we've been enslaved to a life where there's no space no God space between the activities of our life, and God wants to lead us to freedom. And Sabbath is one of the ways he does that. Let's get back to the story. Again, he had just delivered the Israelites from slavery. He's not given the command yet, because he wants to teach them, before I command you to do something, I want to show you that you can trust me. So a couple weeks in, they ran out of food, right? The provisions they packed in Egypt, the coolers were empty. So what did they do? They did what we would do. They complained. They complained to Moses, and Moses would do what I would do. He took it to God, and he began to complain. These stiff-necked people are complaining, God. And God said, oh, I've got them right where I want them. This is an opportunity. I'm going to turn this test into a testimony. It's going to be a testimony of my faithfulness that these people are going to remember what happened in this wilderness for years and years and years. They're going to tell it to their kids and their kids and their grandkids. And before I even give them a commandment, they're just going to know that they can trust me. So he told Moses, here's what I'm going to do. Go back and tell the people I'm going to rain down from heaven this special food. Remember what the name of that food was? Manna. Right. Um, that's what, my, that's what my, my grandson calls my wife. Isn't that cute? Manna. Manna is food from heaven. And that's, that's true. Yeah. Welcome back, Dee Dee and Pastor Mike, too. So manna is this, uh, manna is this special bread that God rained down. It had never happened before. It's never happened since. But God gave some very particular instructions for gathering the manna, gathering the manna instructions. Exodus 16, each morning everyone gathered as much as they needed. Every morning, gather as much as you needed. When the sun grew hot, it melted away. It's only there for a little while. Got to get up, get it. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much. Sixth day get twice as much, two omers, instead of one omer, two omers for each person, and the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded, commanded, tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, that's the seventh day, tomorrow is a Sabbath day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord, so bake what you want to bake on the sixth day and boil what you want to boil, save whatever is left and keep it till morning. So they saved it on the sixth day. They saved it till the morning on the seventh day as Moses commanded. And it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground. No manna on the seventh day. No manna on the seventh day. 
Six days you are to gather, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, it will not be there. There will not be any. So five days, five days, I'm going to rain down manna, go out. Everybody's going to get an omer. Say omer. I'm going to go get an omer. If I get more than an omer, if I get an omer and a half, the half omer is going to go bad. It's going to get maggots in it. Say maggots. <laughs> I love that. I just wanted to hear you say maggots in church. <laughs> on the sixth day, now on the sixth day, I'm going to provide twice as much, go get two omers. And then the next morning, it's not going to go bad. I mean, think of all the things that could go wrong in this scenario if this was not God's provision for his people. See, the deeper purpose of Sabbath is a sign. It's a sign of our faith in God's sovereignty and provision. Sabbath is a symbol. It's us telling the world. It's us telling God. It's telling ourselves that, that we need some God space, that we can step off the throne of our life, that we can put our trust in God. I read this week that, that, that Sabbath, uh, breaking the Sabbath, breaking the command of Sabbath, because it's a sign of our covenant with God that he would be our provider, breaking Sabbath would be like taking off your wedding ring and throwing it at your spouse, burning the national flag. This is how serious God takes Sabbath. It's not optional. It's not a request. It's not a concession for lazy people. Why does God put such a deep emphasis on that? Because it teaches us that God is not just our boss. He's our father. He's a good, good father. He's large and in charge, and he's going to use all the resources of heaven to bless and provide for us. Even when we're walking through the dark valleys of life, that doesn't mean that everything is healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. It means that even through the dark valleys, God will come and walk with us, that his presence with us is what is most important. Sabbath is to time what tithing is to money. We give God the first part of our money. That's our, what belongs to him. He says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse. Put me to the test and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out for you so much blessing. We give God the first part of our day, the first part of our week. We pause today even before we worship, trusting that, that those moments that we give to God and do nothing, that when we step back, God steps in to whatever area of our life. When we step back and hand it over to God, God steps in. Say that with me. When I step back, God steps in. When I step back, God steps in. This summer is proof positive of what I'm talking about. Literally, I did not come on to campus, not one phone call, text message, or email. You know what you guys did? What God did through you, he knocked it out of the park. This is a vacation Bible school. 400 kiddos, 150 adult and student volunteers. We had 33 uh, folks go on mission to Haiti. We had 31 attend high school camp in Georgia. They're floating the Ocoee River here. We had 20, almost 30 people uh, at middle school camp over at Lake of the Ozarks. The cool thing about all that is that nine, nine students, nine individuals who are far from God made a decision to ask Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and their destinies are forever changed. Nine individuals in eternity. And almost every one of those young people say they took a step closer to God on their spiritual journey. Back here at the ranch, you guys did an amazing job. Christmas shop that we raised, where our goal was 25,000, 32,000, way to go. Backpack Impact, 7,177 items. East Campus donated 600 items on their own. They also established a brand new personal essentials pantry, what we have at the New Hope Resource Center. They established in Blackhurst Elementary, one of the poorest schools uh, in the St. Charles community. Uh, financial, uh, emotionally healthy spirituality, a lot more on this. We maxed out uh, that program, 75 participants, 13 table leaders, Financial Peace University still have some space left if you're uh, looking for help getting out of debt and into financial freedom. And Stephen ministers were in the process of 
training 12 more to go along with the 24 we have. These are individuals who've received over 50 hours of training to be extensions of the pastoral care and prayer ministry of the church to walk with people through those dark valleys of life, grief and loss. And all this happened without one little word from me. Not one phone call or text. And I hope, I hope that we've learned a valuable lesson because there was a day when we thought, I thought, nothing really great's going to happen unless I'm involved in it. And way too many of us drank that Kool-Aid. <laughs> but look at what you did. And I hope that God has demonstrated his faithfulness and that we've all learned a lesson. And if not, I'll take one from the team and go on sabbatical again next year. <laughs> this is what I do for you people. Let's see how this manna thing played out. I'm a, two minutes over already. Nevertheless, say this with me, nevertheless. I commanded you, I told you, don't go out and get any on the seventh day because there's not going to be there. Nevertheless. Some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and instructions? How long will you continue to fail to keep my commands? Nevertheless, nevertheless. How long will we continue to nevertheless the Lord's command? I learned something really cool, Pastor, about Sabbath today. Nevertheless, I've got a whole lot of things on my to-do list that I've got to check off before I actually start practicing Sabbath. Hey, Pastor, really cool that God wants me to stop, rest, contemplate, and delight. Man, that sounds awesome. But quite honestly, I don't think that I really believe that God's going to provide, and I'm going to get behind at work, and the neighbors are going to have a prettier house than I have. Maybe you're excited to learn something new about Sabbath, the facts about God, the Bible today. Nevertheless, you get too much of an emotional payoff by getting all those boxes checked of those things to do. It just makes you feel so good about yourself because you're productive. What's it costing? Ask yourself, what is it costing? Sure, it's costing emotional and physical and mental health. But more than that, it's costing a deeper relationship with God. To know that it's not all about you. That your God loves you more than you love yourself. That he's a good father and he wants to provide for you. He wants to come in if you'll put some space between the activities of your life. So for the next three weeks, we're gonna jump in and for the next three weeks, I'm gonna be unpacking the rest of our vision. We're going to be talking next week about the God of restoration, and some of us are in need, our deep need of restoration. We're going to be talking about how we're resourced as a church and by God and the Holy Spirit to enrich our relationships with God, self, and others, and then how we're resourced to reach one more for Jesus Christ. But it was important today, on my first uh, weekend back, that we talk about coming to the well. Because before we do anything for God, we come to the well and we're refreshed by his grace. Sabbath was made for us, not man for the Sabbath. So uh, here's, a, here's a challenge, okay? Here's a challenge. We're not just going to learn about Sabbath today. I'm going I'm to put you to the test. And I know some of you are like, i got so much planned today. How cool would it be if today you just kind of set your to-do list aside and you went home and said, you know what? All right, God, we're just going to. It's going to put you to the, I mean, literally, is the world going to fall apart? If, if you get off the throne today? A couple options. Jewish Sabbath, which I think still holds merit for us. Not that we're Jewish, but I just think it's a good time. Friday night, 6 p.m. to Saturday night, 6 p.m. By the way, you can come to worship and contemplate and worship God as part of that. Saturday night is second option, 6 p.m. to Sunday at 6 p.m. Again, worship is part of that. The key is any 24-hour-in-a-row period. 20, it's, it's not about, oh, I'm going to do, you know, uh, four hours of Sabbath, you know, you know six days. No, it's, it's about a 24-hour a, a, a period of getting off. I 
I could not hold that any longer. <laughs> Bet that hap didn't happen to Keith while I was gone. Okay, we've had our fun, let's get to the <laughs> Four components. Right now, right now, each of you. Which is hardest for you? Which is gonna be the biggest struggle? Is it just gonna be to stop? I mean, you just, you're just not used to stopping. Maybe it's, you're gonna stop, but you, you can't really rest. Every time you stop and just sit down or stop and just you know, start reading your Bible, it's monkey mind, and so, so you can stop, but you really can't rest. Is it going to be coming to worship or spending time, you know, in your Bible or prayers? Is that God peace going to be the hardest? It feels like, you know, delight, that's pretty easy for me, but there's a lot of people who just can't give themselves permission to have fun. It feels lazy or slothful or just they, they don't feel like they deserve to, to have fun. So no judgment, this is just between you and God, but to identify right now which one is going to be the hardest for you. And we're going to take that to God in prayer in, in, in just a minute. But, but I want you to imagine what this could be like. I want you to imagine if you began to practice Sabbath and you, you gave God this opportunity, this God space between the activities of your life for the remaining uh, weeks of September. Imagine what could happen. Imagine what could happen in your own physical, mental your relationship with, with God, your relationship with your, your spouse. If you guys coming in to do this together, if you, if you have kids, what this could do. If, if Sabbath was something that was so special that you planned and prepared for it all week long, you, you all said, hey, we're, we're just going to draw a boundary around this. And, and your kids actually look forward to this Sabbath day, the special day, every single week, and, and it became so important, a family tradition that you would establish right now, and, and, and they would practice, you know, in, in their households, and maybe their grandkids, and, and maybe we could begin to change our culture, and it could begin with you. God gives us a promise. He could just give us a command, but he gives us a promise, and he reminds us that Here's why I do this. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's day holy, honorable, if you honor it not by going your own way and doing your own thing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land and to feast. God wants us to delight in him and this gift of his grace called Sabbath. Amen? Amen? God, we thank you for your gift and being a good, good father. And, and God, your commands, you command us just to stop working, to remind ourselves that it's not about us, that, that you love us so much. But we're not, we're not important and essential to this, this big ball turning around in space. It's going to go on without us. What we are is we're vitally important to you, so much so that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to, to give his life, to, to redeem us from our sins so that we could enjoy your sovereignty and your provision forever in heaven. God, thank you for a foretaste of heaven every single week called Sabbath. We can put our trust in you. Help us to step off our throne. And God, if there's a person here today who, who needs to make that shift, as, as those nine students did this summer, need to make that shift, get off their throne, and, and, and ask you to be Savior and Lord. If I'm talking to you today, just say in your heart to God, Father, forgive me of my sin. Today, I begin to turn over everything. I realize it's going to be a process. I realize that I don't have all the information or the knowledge, but there is something pulling me toward you today. The Bible says that Jesus stands at the door of your heart and knocks. And if you just open that door, if you just step back and open that door, God will step in today. Father, be our Lord and Savior. Thank you for Jesus, the forgiveness of our sins. And when we make this de declaration, we can trust that we are going to be with you in eternity. And all God's people agreed and said together,